Good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, I welcome all of you to, uh, to the follow-up of our uh, Working Group 2 presentation that took place on the very big event on the 30th of June. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for joining us. Um, we can, we're going to start with the presentation um, by our team and then we are going to open the floor for, uh, for questions. Uh, Louisa, would you put the presentation, please? Morning. Yes. Thank you, Louisa. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Working Group 2. Um, can you go to the title uh, slide, please? Thank you. Um, the title of our, for our working group was Preparing National International Strategies for Economic Recovery and uh, Revitalization. The co-chairs for this working group are uh, Carol Lanou of Center European uh, Studies and myself, Abdel Abdel Latif from the Egyptian Center for Economic uh, Studies. We welcome all of you. Uh, we believe, our entire crowd, actually, we believe very strongly that this topic is actually the most important topic because it's almost a precondition for all the other working groups. If the economies do not recover, then there is very little else that can be done. Uh, next slide, please, Lisa. Um, this is showing our entire group um, uh, uh, of working group two, the, all the members. And, and I have to say that it was really a pleasurable experience uh, over a month and a half. We worked very closely and we managed to do almost uh, um, an impossible job uh, because it was not really very easy, but it was enjoyable. Could you please uh, mute yourselves? Anyone who's, uh, please, uh, please mute so that everybody can hear. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we start the presentation by talking about our objective and our rationale for it. And uh, uh, before I state the objective, let me say that we had lots of deep discussions at, uh, from at the beginning among us because we are very much aware of the large number of policies that need to be tackled and the differences between countries and regions and cultures everywhere. So the, the, our, our big problem was how do we get something that is acceptable by all and that com that's common uh, for all and that at the same time is substantial and makes sense and can take economies uh, uh, forward. So our discussion led to a very specific objective. We actually offered in our report strategic direction and uh, uh, guidelines for action-oriented policies and the words are very well chosen here, action-oriented. We're not talking about just policies, we're talking about ones that lead to action and, and actually implementation. Uh, action-oriented policies to help nations, regions, and the globe recover in a healthy way. And the, the key word here is healthy way. It's so countries can recover by simply returning back to their old systems, okay? But that would not be a healthy way of doing it. The healthy way is to lead a sustainable recovery from COVID-19. Uh, and uh, why uh, sustainable recovery? Because anything other than sustainable recovery we believe will not be substantial, nor will it protect the world from collapses. I mean, we can recover and then at, if there is another pandemic, we would collapse again. So the whole idea is by being sustainable. And a sustainable recovery is one that is both resilient and inclusive. And the three key words that we kept through and that we respected all the way were the sustainability, the resilience, and the inclusivity. Next slide, please. We believe that there are preconditions for success in realizing this objective or in realizing the mission of the economic uh, uh, recovery. And the preconditions for success are all health related. Okay? And uh, because health is actually the, the key element here, uh, we start by saying that adopting an effective public health policy is essential and is extremely important. And it's not only health related, it's actually very sound economic policies. When we, think about, when we talk about public health policy, we are not talking about a health-related issue, we are talking about economics. And it is the very first step for economic recovery and a precondition for uh, sustainable economic recovery. We mentioned specific examples of things that must exist all at the health level, 
Governments need to make sure that there are medical facilities that are available to treat all and that conditions for reopening are safe. It's a must. Governments must have a coordinated rapid response to disaster. And this means having a team that is well integrated in order to manage the uh, uh, response. Uh, there must be preparation for future pandemics. It, the preparation for future pandemics must remain a top priority because we know, unfortunately, that they will be coming. And that's the whole idea about the uh, uh, sustainability. And then finally, it's very important that governments work on all factors at the same time, on the health factor, on the economic factor, and on the freedom of the society, on all of those dimensions, and to work on them in concert and not as competing targets. Because more often than not, we see, you know, you, you push the economy, then you give up uh, uh, the, 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 the freedom of the society, for instance. This cannot take place. They can all be going in concert because they are not competing targets, why? Because a healthy uh, society, a physically healthy society, is one that is economically strong and free. From here on, we see our basic principles uh, uh, that are needed for the recovery. And then from there, we are going to go to the different uh, subdivisions of policies that need to be uh, tackled. And I invite my colleague Lisa to present the principles. Please, please, Lisa. Thank you, Abla. Uh, some of the things that we really looked at here, one of the key underlying factors uh, that draws on Abba's point about having a sustainable, a resilient, and an inclusive uh, recovery is the fact that we don't want to let this crisis go to waste, to paraphrase the old phrase. And my colleague, Mark Elder, I want to give him credit, really insisted on the phrase building forward better. So as we said before, it's not simply enough to try and put the pieces back together. It's in fact to use this crisis as an opportunity to really undertake more structural, deeper changes that can really have a positive impact. And again, those changes need to be consistent with UN sustainable goals, development goals, and as Abla was pointing out, right, healthy people, a uh, healthy ecological system, and of course, a healthy and sustainable recovery are inextricably linked. We want to make sure, again, in terms of our principles and our policies, that we are focusing on investing in human capital, in particular, of course, in the areas of education and health. We want to be looking at seeking improved efficiency of how we're doing things and making sure that governance principles are being adhered to. And we want to be thinking about that the policies that we are building and implementing are flexible and they're dynamic. Again, you're seeing this interplay that we've put all the way through that it's not simply enough just to think about the pandemic. It's the pandemic. We have climate change. We have inequalities. We have structural issues that are going on in our various countries. And we want to make sure that we don't resist the temptation to not engage in the longer term reforms and let this opportunity go to waste. Next slide, please. In addition, and the key principles you'll see here, we put a, a great emphasis on coordination and collaboration. So again, national recovery strategies need to be coordinated with robust roles for the international organizations. We'll be talking about that later. And we wanna see really cooperation that's enshrined going forward. So that again is important to maintain that sustainability for the medium and long term. A key topic that we looked at and we had a lot of debate about was the fact that we wanna be integrating support for democracy and inclusive free markets because they are important as a means to developing practical solutions. At the same time, we understand that there's a healthy interplay between them and the fact that we want to mitigate any corruption and any governance issues as well. And finally, we wanna be looking at how are we creating and adjusting our incentives to mitigate this crisis, both in climate and in health, going forward. So we'll take it from there and now see how they play out in the various subgroups. We can move forward to our next. Our, our next. Okay. <clears throat> this is uh, Jan Hagemeyer, uh, Case uh, Center for Social and Economic Research based in Warsaw, Poland. And before I start on economic policies, I'd like to say that uh, it is important that we understand that there is no one-size-fits-all policy that will work for everyone. 
and uh, there are important differences on social and uh, uh, economic policy preferences uh, when it comes to the uh, role and the size of the government, the degree of redistribution, and the approach toward market institution. So um, we need to take this into account, but it remains clear that in times like this, uh, striking a balance between the short and the long-term goals is crucial. And uh, in our uh, in our um, part of the of the of the report, uh, we clearly distinguish between the near-term ter measures adopted to deal with immediate crisis and <clears throat> caused by the COVID-19, but also on the longer-term issues and opportunities. So. Um, our main recommendations are listed on the slide, and the first one is to prioritize the efficient use of resources while also uh, targeting inclusive growth and social justice. So this is the, the main priority that the Green Party uh, uh, visibly know the recommendations that we, that we, uh, that we show uh, in our part of the, of the report. So the, um, as far as these as this short-term emergency measures are concerned, uh, there is a plethora of recommended of recommended responses, and they vary from the international level, where uh, liquidity of central banks has to be supported, but also uh, it uh, goes to the national, regional, and municipal level, where uh, where uh, direct lending uh, to local and regional governments might be a uh, important uh, part of the short-term financing. Uh, <clears throat> And there is need for uh, government support for uh, so small and medium enterprises and community groups that are the most vulnerable to, uh, to, to the COVID-19 crisis. And also these uh, policies should address uh, the wave of job losses uh, and the loss, the loss of income sources for, for uh, individuals and for groups of individuals. And this could be supported by the payments to households. And of course, we have to recognize that while developed countries have means to introduce all of these, for developing countries, it's not so, it's not so easy. So here, uh, governments should prioritize recapitalizing development banks and micro funds using sovereign wealth funds where possible, and offering uh, critical funding to support trade finance, regional and micro lending facilities. However, um, as far as uh, we go to the medium and long term, we have to recognize that uh, uh, this financial support cannot continue uh, con co cannot continue forever for two reasons. One is, of course, the fiscal reason uh, that we cannot afford this, and the other one is that uh, it distorts uh, incentives and creates moral hazard. So, as we go along, the governments should want to redirect uh, some of the aid towards businesses geared towards increasing innovation, eco-friendly priorities, and, and, and SDGs. Uh, this, is, this is crucial as far as this uh, uh, inclusive growth and social justice and uh, uh, sustainable growth is, uh, is, is concerned. So we should avoid uh, using COVID-19 to, to support industry that <coughs> have been on life support already before the pandemic. Uh, as far as uh, long-term goals are concerned, uh, the COVID-19 might be an excuse to actually uh, stop and de or delay structural and institutional reforms. And we would uh, really discourage governments to do that. Uh, so the crisis is causing countries to turn inward. And in some cases, it means reversing the processes of uh, liberalization, privatization, uh, and also, government intervention is uh, uh, is is, is uh, generally has increased government involvement in markets and has deteriorated competition in market mechanism. So, we should recognize this as, as a threat to long-term stability and prosperity. And there is a lot of history, economic history, that tells us about that. Um, however, this institutional reforms that were going on before uh, the crisis 
they should continue. In particular, when we think about uh, the easiness of doing business, the business closures, uh, business opening, that's going to happen a lot right now, right? There will be business that will go bankrupt. There will be businesses that will, uh, that will, that will emerge. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the, the obstacles to uh, running business are uh, as low as possible. Uh, switching to the labor markets, they must balance the interests of workers and employers, but they have to allow a degree of flexibility. Uh, to prepare for uh, possible future disruptions like the one that we observe right now, um, we might want to have the features in the labor market that allow for temporary adjustment of wages, a flexible work week, and some uh, possibility of work sharing similar to the ones that are present in Germany. Um, <clears throat> moreover, as far as tax policy is concerned, or fiscal policy in general, uh, the crisis has, however, uh, some important distributional consequences and we will likely to require tax reform. Of course, here countries differ a lot in the, the, the approach to the, to, the, to the tax system, but uh, uh, it might be the case that we, in fact, looking at the increase of, uh, of inequality, we might consider uh, uh, having a more progressive tax system, either through enacting a range of tax rate, tax credits, uh, as well as taxes on wealth or capital, but also increasing fiscal space, finding new sources of revenue. Uh, for example, uh, uh, increasing collection rates, uh, implement some green taxes, uh, <clears throat> and that would, for example, enable us to reduce some of the consumption taxes, the ones that are, so to say, uh, uh, putting a lot of burden on the poor. And as far as fiscal space is concerned, we also, in particular in developing countries where fiscal space is small, uh, we should work, I mean, the, 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 the developing countries should work on, uh, we should work on increasing that fiscal space, uh, improving the tax system, and move towards a counter cyclical and stabilizing fiscal policy. In developing countries, fiscal policy tends to be pro cyclical, which is uh, making things worse in, uh, in uh, times like this. And as a last point, uh, looking at the uh, accumulation of debt, there are countries where, even before COVID-19, um, the, the, the debt in those countries was unsustainable. And uh, right now, resolving this would be, uh, this problem would be even uh, harder. And uh, in fact, the, the process might be complex and might require uh, debt, debt restructuring or even debt forgive, forgiveness, while making sure that the access to market financing is for those countries that use this debt forgiveness is not penalized. So we think that both lenders and borrowers must compromise and commit to new terms where lenders accept some losses while sovereign borrowers commit to undertake fiscal and structural reforms uh, to stabilize and revive the economy generating income or to service the debt. Um, and uh, it is important that these uh, uh, instruments that, 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 that involve some debt restructuring or debt forgiveness are linked to uh, implementing recommended reforms, including uh, including uh, structural reforms, including uh, supporting innovation, and including uh, sustainability. And uh, that would be all. Oh, thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, about now the informal economy. Informal economy exists everywhere in the world, in all countries in the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, um, the lower the level of development, the more you see it. Uh, more often than not, countries uh, look at it as a burden on the economy, when in reality, we believe that it is a jewel in the rough, okay? Uh, and it needs uh, fixing. Countries need to uh, accommodate the informal sector within the whole formal economy. By so doing, this is, um, achieves more efficiency, better use of resources, more inclusiveness, 
because the informal economy involves a lot of women, a lot of young, uh, uh, a lot of young people. Uh, so, um, and, the, and, and everyone in the informal sector was very much negatively affected during COVID-19. And COVID-19 actually is an opportunity if we're talking about sustainable recovery, healthier recovery, then definitely accommodating the informal sector has to be part of it. And accommodating it does not mean taxing it because most countries look at it this way. And we want the informal sector in because we want to tax it. No, the idea is to have better job uh, uh, opportunities, better job uh, circumstances, better production, uh, uh, bigger GDP, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, we believe that irrespective of the country, the strategic approach to dealing with the informal sector needs to be built on, on three pillars. First one is to have decent database. We need to have information about everyone that's working there and the nature of their activities. Without information, you cannot have uh, uh, policies to deal with it. We also need to make formality the easiest solution. And this is really very straightforward. The, the main reason why people go to the informal sector is because the formal sector actually is, is, is a pain. Either enterprises there are already suffering from loss of bureaucracy or there are no job uh, 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 opportunities. So if you make formality the easiest uh, uh, option, uh, good circumstances for working there, this in itself is going to discourage going to the informal sector. The third pillar is that we need to have a comprehensive reform approach to informality. And this means understanding informality. It's not one huge jello thing uh, uh, whose, whose nature is not clear. Informal sector actually consists of individuals who work there informally, uh, enterprises that are informal in nature in the sense that their legal papers are not correct, and lots of informal transactions that are taking place within the formal sector itself or between the formal sector and the informal sector. Each one of these has a different uh, approach. Each one of these has a different entry point. So when we talk about the comprehensive approach, we are talking about putting the solutions for each one of these. Also, there is a way of tackling the inflow, the newcomers to the informal sector and others to tackle with the existing stock within the informal sector. Each one of these needs different uh, policies and actually the report is touching upon this. Uh, uh, just as, as an example for, for the content, uh, uh, reducing the inflow to the informal uh, sector or informal employment and uh, leading to an elimination over time because you are not adding newcomers, it requires basically improving the conditions of work for the private sector. The private sector is the main job created in the different uh, uh, economies. So if you improve the conditions, the business environment within which the private sector is operating, then you improve its ability to create, to create jobs. Okay? Uh, that's one thing. Uh, allowing for social mobility, and allowing for social mobility means a lot of things. Means a system that is transparent, means a system that uh, uh, where you are educated in engineering, you work in engineering, and you can find actually a job in that, in that area. You don't graduate from school and you cannot find you cannot find jobs, and therefore you cannot improve your status okay, from being poor to a uh, higher income level. Improving the entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem <coughs> is essential for cutting, again, the informality. Uh, the informal sector, interestingly enough, and this is actually discovered all over the world, involves lots and lots of talented people. So if we have a good entrepreneurial ecosystem, okay, this is going to attract the talented people who go to the informal sector because they cannot, again, find their way through in any other way. Uh, another way is to eliminate the premature entrance. People enter the informal sector to work because they are poor. Okay? So as a matter of fact, focusing on the development objective of the country okay, itself is going to encourage the end of the informality and it, the accommodation into the formal, into the formal uh, 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 sector. Uh, uh, among also other, uh, uh, other, other policies, like for instance, this differentiating, uh, eliminating the, the differences between the benefits in the governmental job and in the private sector job. Okay? This is very important in, in a country uh, like Egypt and, and others. Because of this difference, people are waiting for the governmental job, which will never, which will never come. And until, uh, while waiting for it, they go to the informal sector, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think one of the uh, key advantages, or let's see, the silver lining of COVID-19, 
is to focus attention on the informal sector, on its size, on its importance, and on the importance of dealing with its problems in the right way and accommodating it into the economy. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Mark Elder. I'm at the Global the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies uh, in Japan. Uh, this section is about uh, the roles of the government, private sector, and civil society. Uh, of course, different countries have different situations, but uh, we came up with a few points that may apply to a variety of countries, although not necessarily uh, all of them. Um, I'd like to make uh, four uh, main points. Um, Starting with the government, uh, first, uh, recovery assistance efforts need to highlight and promote the principles of resilience, adaptation, and sustainability uh, over an extended period. So especially, uh, government assistance should be conditioned on ESG, which is Environment Social Governance uh, Criteria, uh, in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. Governments are spending huge amounts of money, up to 10 or 20% of even of GDP in some cases, and therefore, it should focus on building forward better, not going back to unsustainable practices which weren't working. So this could be based on themes of green recovery, clean energy transformation, and green infrastructure, uh, which would create many jobs. Also, conditions need to be attached to this huge amount of financial assistance. It should support basic needs and jobs and the immediate needs of the health, center, health sector and not corporate profits, stock buybacks, or executive bonuses. So maintaining employment should be the key focus, and regulations related to the environment, health, safety, and consumer protection should not be relaxed. Second point is that uh, governments should prioritize sustaining the social safety net within a framework that also addresses other urgent issues, such as climate change and sustainable infrastructure investment. So this is especially the case if the COVID-19 crisis lasts for an extended period and the focus need, would need to be on economic life support even rather than real recovery. So some countries may need to expand capacity to care for children and seniors as well as unemployment insurance. In terms of uh, healthcare, countries have a wide variety of uh, systems. However, resilient public health systems, especially pandemic preparedness and response systems, are key public health goods, are, are key public goods which have suffered from chronic underinvestment worldwide. And these also provide jobs, uh, and, there are not, and these jobs are not well suited to be managed by the private sector since they generate little short-term profit and stockpile emergency equipment which might not be used and the scale of the needed investment is modest compared to the massive economic recovery programs and private healthcare systems in some countries. So my third point is that the private sector needs to develop safe and sustainable work procedures and uh, safely and sustainably provide goods and services. So for example, if the workers and consumers are sick or if they die, then the economy will not be able to recover. Workers need protective equipment and customers also need to be protected. And this may uh, require some uh, kind of an investment and support. So the fourth point uh, is that multi-stakeholder collaboration with civil society groups will ensure robust, effective, and sustainable outcomes. For example, for measures to ensure the safety and health of workers and customers, uh, the best approach is not always clear and different approaches may be needed in different conditions. On one hand, top-down standards created by the governments uh, might be difficult to implement, but on the other hand, standards created by the private sector alone might not prioritize, or might prioritize profits over safety. So a balanced approach is needed. So uh, that's all, um, and uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tetsushi Sonobe, the Dean of Asian Development Bank Institute. The title of my part is Digitalization as a Driver of Economic Recovery. It is widely recognized that digital infrastructure and technologies are vital to maintaining productivity and controlling costs in the COVID-19 era. The demand for digitalization is higher than ever before. G20 members agreed to increase digital connectivity 
encourage collaboration to collect and share big data in order to prevent the further spread of the coronavirus. Efforts are also being made to promote research and development of digital technologies for health and ad adaptation of digital solutions in a variety of settings. Wide ranging innovations will offer societies and businesses the ability to leverage the drastically increased demand for digitalization as a tool to promote greater health and prosperity. What is missing is an understanding of the prospect that digitalization can play a role as a driver of economic recovery from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. More than applying tools and policies, global leaders can use their role to inspire hope in people around the world, especially vulnerable groups. That said, significant hurdles remain. Digital connectivity is far from equal within and between countries. Global leaders and governments must press for the scaling up of digital infrastructure investment. Disruptive innovation tends to eliminate jobs, even though it creates new employment opportunities over time. This phenomenon has disproportionately affected less educated, more vulnerable groups, while the benefits have accrued among the better off. Education assumes greater importance in redressing this imbalance so people can acquire skills that will help them access newly created jobs. As the economies rely more on digital technologies and big data, greater efforts are needed to protect consumers, combat cyber threats, and reach global agreements to safeguard privacy and intellectual property rights. In addition, Antitrust legislation and closing tax loopholes domestically and internationally could help address concerns about market concentration and tax base erosion by platform and tech giants. Global leaders should work together to this end. Capturing tax revenues could provide resources to support digitalization while rewarding innovators with a smaller slice of a larger pie. Acknowledging these barriers and challenges, global should the way to progress toward a global digital economy with no one left behind. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Maria Clara Escobar. I am uh, representing ICP from Colombia, and I'm gonna talk about SMEs, small and medium um, enterprises. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected large and small enterprises, but the effects have been especially severe on the small and medium sized enterprises. There is an important consensus about the fundamental role that SMEs play in the world economy. They are strongly <laughs> excuse me, related to economic growth, employment generation, and will contribute to achieve some of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Among them, SDGs 8, which is decent work and economic growth, um, SDG 9, which is industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and SDG 10, which is reduced inequalities. Um, without an economic recovery, that creates jobs, boosts innovation and economic growth, it will be impossible to overcome the crisis derived from the COVID-19. Pandemic and uh, pandemic, um, and, it, and, and it will be also impossible to achieve a sustainable development in the next years and, de and, and decades. Therefore, we recommend specific short, medium, and long-term measure, measures to be taken in order to support them um, to float and recover. As short-term measures, SMEs need to be safe to reopen, and governments should establish safety guidelines, especially concerning social distancing policies, 
including protective equipment when required. SMEs also need liquidity to survive. They need temporary subsidies to support workers' salaries. Um, otherwise, most of them will have to suspend their activities and employment figures will increase. These transfers should be, therefore, conditioned to retain, to retain employees. Also, it is necessary to protect the credit flow for SMEs. Even in normal times, SMEs are at disadvantage to access credits. The uncertainty that the pandemic brought to financial markets will probably cause SMEs <coughs> to, excuse me, <coughs> to struggle even more in order to access credit. From a long-term perspective, Perspective, we must realize that the idea is not only to recover, but to take this pandemic crisis as an opportunity to recover better. Therefore, it, um, it is important to establish conditions to promote a better SMEs environment. To begin with, all the long-term measures that will be taken to help SMEs recover must be guided by green criteria. We want to emphasize that SMEs require less tax burdens and more flexibilization. It is necessary to make the creation and operation of SMEs easier. A more efficient tax code should be designed and the costs associated with formal operations should be reduced. It is important as well to reduce the tax burdens for SMEs. The priority should be on regulations to open businesses and to start operations. Furthermore, the governments must design um, much more, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> must, mu must design more efficient tax codes. That way, significantly, significantly reduce the tax and labor costs and could boost recovery. Of course, it is important that these measures are taken within the framework of healthy, responsible and sustainable fiscal policies. This crisis is an opportunity as well to simplify the unnecessary bureaucratic processes. Governments should maintain more accurate and detailed databases about SMEs so that in the event of a new unexpected crisis, they are able to more rapidly and efficiently disperse aid and adopt accurate recovery, recovery measures. Finally, it will be desirable for SMEs to create linkages with bigger enterprises being part of the value chains of production. Let me now mention some examples that our group gathered that revealed different initiatives undertaken to, support, undertaken to support SMEs. First, it is important to notice that the private sector has made important donations to help SMEs recover. One of the examples, it's Amazon, uh, who has created a 5 million neighborhood small business, businesses relief fund to provide cash grants to uh, Seattle area's small businesses. Uh, Facebook, on its part, has created a 100 million grant program for small businesses by providing bo both advertising credits and cash grants that can be spent, spent on operational costs, such as paying workers and paying rent. More examples can be found all around the world. Second, from the government side, important measures have been taken around the world to help SMEs to continue their operation and recover from this crisis. In Germany, for example, there are 10 billion euros available in direct subsidies to one-person businesses and micro-enterprises. In Canada, on its part, introduced Canada on its part introduced an emergency support benefit for self-employed for self-employed who do not qualify for employment insurance. Saudi Arabia has established some measures to support the wages of Saudi employees in the private sector to ensure the stability of enterprises. Here in Colombia, the government offered uh, a warranty that will have 90% coverage and will support disbursements made by financial entities to finance the value 
of monthly payrolls in SMEs. Singapore has deferred income tax payments for companies and self-employed persons for three months, as well as cash payouts. Ireland has expanded, uh, expanded microfinance, uh, the microfinanced um, Ireland funding by 13 million euros to 20 million euro, euros for COVID-19 loans, with interest rates dropped from 7.8% 7, 7 to 4.5%. More examples can be found in the main document that our group prepared. Let me share with you uh, uh, some conclusions. So in the first place, SMEs are essential to a vigorous, dynamic economy. Second, SMEs are fragile, especially during a, pandem during a pandemic, and governments must do everything possible to help them to survive and recover in a sustainable way. Third, it is not the first crisis humanity must overcome, and it will not be the last one. SMEs should rely on governments and policies that are ready to become more flexible when it is necessary. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Carol, Carol is not, Luisa, Luisa, is Luisa in? Yes, I'm in. I'm in the call. Can you um, read the slides? Can you read the slides yes, on behalf of, of course. Kat? So, um, on multilateralism and international organizations, we have uh, this is the sixth of the key focus and recommendation areas. Uh, the main question was uh, how can organizations reinvigorate the international system? So, we have uh, three main recommendations, of which the first one is to create a global healthcare stability board. A coordinating body to integrate healthcare policies in cooperation with the WHO, OECD, IMF, and World Bank. The second recommendation is to enact reforms to current G7 and G20 economic policy coordinating bodies to make them more representative. And uh, the last uh, point to undertake reforms of the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, and review governance quota funding of the IMF. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. It's very important, uh, if, I, if I make a couple of comments here, um, we, when we were talking about the policies, it was very clear that the national policies cannot work alone. They have to work hand in hand with international policies. They have to go together. And this means a much better and stronger role by the different international uh, uh, organizations in support uh, uh, of the different countries. Uh, part of it is what uh, Jan, Jan mentioned at the beginning about forgiving some of the debt. Uh, uh, and forgiving some of the debt means that uh, it, the countries will not be penalized for not paying. They will not be looked at as if they fail to pay, but rather uh, uh, they need to be supported by canceling those old debt and they will still have chances in the future for taking loans in order to be able to continue with their, with their development. So the multilateral role is extremely important and essential and it completes the others. It's all one package, it's all one framework. Next slide, please, Luisa. Okay, the next slide is my actually favorite slide. Can we push, push the button again? This, the, the, the slide here is just a picture that is trying to show what we've been trying to do really. What we've been trying to do over the, over the last month and a half is to cross this, this, this big, this huge, gap okay this huge gap and the only way to do it okay is by adopting inclusivity resilience and sustainability and these are three big doors behind each door are a number a number of policies in order to be able to do it uh, this is the only way we can cross such a gap and this gap and this burden is really COVID-19 and any future uh, uh, pandemic one thing that we agreed upon uh, uh, through our discussions is that this is just the beginning. Okay? And we really thank Jim for the opportunity of letting us know each other and, and, and get to work uh, 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 together. This is just the beginning. Why? Because even as COVID-19 disappears slowly, hopefully, there are, there, the situation is very fluid and very dynamic. There will always be new challenges. There will always be needs. Uh, uh, to look at, at uh, the future. Our key messages are clear. 
we need to adopt the policies that let our recovery uh, uh, healthy. We should not slow down or stop going for the institutional reforms and the structural reforms that are needed in our countries, because this is the way for becoming uh, 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 healthy. We need to focus on inclusiveness. It cannot be, it cannot be ignored. And you've seen and the digitization is at the heart of everything. If you notice what was presented by Maria and the SMEs and what I presented in the informal sector are very similar to each other. If you improve the conditions for the SMEs, if you improve the conditions for the informal, for the private sector, then you are going to find jobs and you'll be able to accommodate the, uh, uh, the informality and have a much stronger economy, one that, can, uh, that is resilient and that can face new uh, uh, pandemics.